from the Psych Hub Podcast Network. Hi, I'm Marjorie Morrison. And this is Patrick Kennedy. And you are listening to the Psych Hub Podcast, the future of mental health. Hi, and welcome to the future of mental health. Today's guest is none other than former governor of Ohio, John Kasich. It was a great conversation, which I really think you're all going to enjoy. Unfortunately, Patrick wasn't able to join us, but he recorded some thoughts he'd like you to hear first. Let's take a listen. I want to thank Governor Kasich for his service, not only to Ohio, but to this country. Um, His work, not only in Congress, where I had the honor of serving with him, but his incredible work as governor of Ohio, setting a model through his being at such a champion for ensuring that those with mental illness and addiction get uh, cared for through the state's expanded Medicaid program uh, is really an inspiration uh, to all of us. Um, Through his leadership, there are people today that are surviving and thriving from the disease of addiction and mental illness because they got access to care that they would have not had had there not been a governor like Governor Kasich who was willing to step forward and just do the right thing, not along partisan lines, but to follow the facts, to do what was right. And uh, Governor Kasich has always had that uh, respect from both sides of the aisle for his independence and his uh, integrity. And uh, it's really my honor to uh, count him as a friend. And I so much uh, appreciate all that he continues to do to advance this cause, which he made such a difference in advancing when he was governor of Ohio. All right. And now to my conversation with Governor Kasich. Governor Kasich, welcome to the show. We're so excited to have you. You are such an inspiration for our country and all that you have done. And, you know, you really have a a good sense of mental health and how you kind of tie mental health into everything that you talk about. I hear it come up in so much of your messaging. So why don't you share for us a little bit of just kind of your thinking about it at at a high level? Well, I, you know, this is uh, the issue of mental health is something that's been kind of largely ignored. I mean, it was something we we didn't want to talk about in our families. Uh, one of the cool things that I'm working with is an organization out of Nationwide Children's Hospital called On Our Sleeves, and it's directed to young people. You know, um, being a father or being a human being, for that matter, we think about those precious young people and the fears and the hopes and the anxieties and everything else they have. And um, what Nationwide Children's has done has been able to, one thing, we've been able to reach out to a million classrooms across America, providing information to teachers, to counselors, which helps parents to be able to navigate the things that are, are the issues that our children go through. And I have, and I have to tell you, that I'm very, very excited about this Bloom program. And Bloom is a program where we are providing information to employers because we know that the issue of concern in the work workplace actually hurts the productivity of our employees there. We can improve their productivity if we're able to be in a position where we can also give them access to information. And we would love for you to go uh, you, you, you can go on our, uh, uh, all of our website on our sleeves.org and learn about what we're doing to help children because Marjorie, we, we tend to always focus on adults and what we don't realize is that if we can help kids when they're little, uh, in the very early years, most of the time we're going to overcome anything that might, uh, affect them later on in their lives. So uh, I'm really excited to be working with nationwide children's. Uh, on both Bloom, which means we go into the businesses and it's free for nonprofits. Businesses will have to cover some of the costs of our technology, but it it won't be a lot. And then there's On Our Sleeves, where I've been able to be involved in getting people to do roundups to support our program. Uh, And by the way, the information that we provide comes from people who are the clinical researchers, 
the, the doctors who are really in the field. And um, it's an exciting program. You can learn more about all this uh, through onoursleeves.org. And so, and then at the same time, I'm also involved in some adult mental health um, uh, with a operation in Texas and a gentleman by the name of Andy Keller, who I know knows, uh, knows Patrick. And I think Marjorie, you know him as well. He is a pioneer um, and uh, with the Meadows Foundation in, in Texas. In fact, I'm going to appear with him on a panel, which is really exciting because he's the, he's the genius. He's the brains. He's the guy. I get a ch- privilege to work with him and we'll be together at the Ideas Festival down in Austin uh, on one uh, one of these panels talking about the issue of mental health. So I'm kind of, uh, you know, engaged at all levels on it. I love it. So first of all, On Our Sleeves, what an amazing organization. They've done so much work. And I think when our listeners go to the site, they did such a clever, the marketing around it, the um, just the way that they're reaching their audiences. We we love the organization. Um, it's been it's been great getting to know them and the amazing work that they do. I think we're all really excited to see that scale even bigger because it's so needed. So first of all, thank you for your partnership and with that because you're absolutely right. That is very much um, something so needed. Uh, just to, just a word about Bloom because on our sleeves that you know, what we've done in the classroom, but this Bloom program where we can work with employers and all we're asking employers to do is make this information available to their employees. So you've got a mom or a dad sitting at work and they've got, you've got a troubled kid at home or wherever, and this gives them the information that they need to be able to navigate. I mean, they're not, we're not expecting them to solve all the problems, but we give them uh, a compass as to how they can deal with their kids a little bit and when they need to take them to a professional. Uh, you know what it's all like and, you know, everything costs so much. And I mean, it's just a confusing uh, place and anything we can do to help parents to be more clear, more in control, the better for them. And guess what? Better for the kids. Yes. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, we do, you know, Psych Hub does a lot of mental health education too, um, but it's all so needed. And there's just, parents need help too. You know, it's the information for their kids, but you're right, like also getting them the right information. So um, I look forward to like learning more about Bloom as well. I love both the names too, because I yeah. feel like that's, yeah, that's such a great name. Um, then I'm also like, but I'm also really happy that you're involved in Meadows. Uh, I just think that's another really good example of an organization that started with a regional, you know, in Texas um, kind of goal and footprint and now really expanding out partnerships, very strategic. Um, they do such great work. They're also partners of Psych Hub. So we also really, really like um, working with them. And I, I'm just, I think the work that, that that organization is doing is is critical. So I'm excited to hear about your talk with them. What's interesting also, I, I should mention, with Nationwide Children's, we have them involved with the Centene company helping uh, in Uvalde to try to help with the children. And I believe we've got Andy's folks involved as well uh, at Meadows. And, you know, Andy's a remarkable guy, what he's been able to do in Texas. In fact, we just had a call, you know, the last couple of weeks with uh, the governor's office in Maryland, talking to them about Andy's plan. And also we've had a call with Ohio State uh, in terms of being able to expand this notion. And I I think this may be one of the keys is if we can target the primary care operations. And often there's just not individual offices, but those systems themselves. If we can begin to connect people like you, uh, Marjorie, with these primary care doctors. You know, it was really interesting. My personal physician, uh, I don't even know how it came up. We're, we're friends too. And he told me one time he spends so much of his time listening to his patients. He feels like he's a psychologist because of the conversations. He told me this years ago. And I, I, was, I was so interested in it, but I, I didn't think much more about it until Andy came up with this idea. Andy Keller came up with this idea to try to connect the behavioral health experts with primary care doctors. So when a primary care doctor hears of a problem, instead of just kind of having a short conversation for something that's serious, they can refer them over. But you know how difficult this is. But this, to me, creates a linchpin for treatment 
throughout our country, and it needs to be funded. Um, you know, there's never enough money. There's never, there's always enough money for the people who walk the halls in Washington uh, for all this nonsense that sometimes goes on down there, but never enough money for these kinds of programs for keeping us healthier as a society. We have to push for it. So I love, I'm glad that you brought this up. So I heard you speak at, at AHIP and we were all sort of like, we're like, he's talking about the collaborative care model and he isn't like saying it, but that's exactly what that is. When I and say collaborative care, uh, <laughs> let's, Marjorie, nobody knows what it is. It's but when so I say, true. We're going to have a primary care doctor who can work with somebody who understands behavior. Now, you know, let's make it simple, make it easy for people to get. It's so true. And it it's it's 100 percent. We it's where people land with mental health issues so many times they land in our health system, whether it's primary care, whether it's in the emergency room, whether it's with the cardiologist. I had Governor Kasich a, a conversation about last week or two weeks ago with an oncologist. And this oncologist told me, ready for this? 80 percent of his time is spent dealing with mental health issues only about 20% working with cancer. And he said, you know, if you think about it, you give someone a diagnosis, you're going through this treatment, they're dealing with all of, you know, the what what the potential is that could happen with, with treatment and their life and all of that. It's mental health, right? So you're absolutely right. So how do we tie all this together? Well, Marjorie, you know, the other thing is, and I'm looking at your credentials, you know, licensed professional clinical counselor, I, when I see that, I think burnout, you know, I think, God, it's such a hard job. And then I look at the school psychologist. I wanted, when I was governor, I wanted to have a program because right now we use the guidance counselors to be psychologists and they're not trained to do that. But then the question gets to be, we pay all these people who, you know, sports figures, actors, all this money, but yet we pay people who work in nursing homes we pay people who work as social workers trying to deal with these issues. We pay them a pittance, and then we wonder why we don't have them. Because we don't have to have everybody being, right, a, a psychologist. I mean, if we had social workers pro- properly trained, I mean, this whole field needs to grow. But if there's no money in it, it's kind of hard to, because you do it, it's a labor of love. It's probably something that the Lord inspired you to do. But it doesn't work that way for everybody. And um, but to me, if we can come up back to what you were asking, if we can come up with the dollars to help physicians to be able or these practices uh, to be able to connect, even if it's virtually with somebody who can help their patients, that to me is a giant leap forward. So we, we would need Andy was able to get money out of the Texas legislature for this. And my, I, you know, I like Texas and everything, but, you know, you don't actually think about them going into this and spending money. Andy talked them into it, but it can't be just a one time grant. There has to be a flow of money to support this because we know what the implications are if people go untreated. I mean, and I mean, many different things that that happen to them living on the streets, yeah. maybe picking up a gun. Um, I there's just. There's just so much that can go wrong. And being the whole former budget chairman, people used to say, well, if we spend money on this. Well, we'll save so much money. And I say, well, all these programs, you say that. And then we got trillions in debt. But this is one where you get a payoff. Prioritize right. this at all levels of government because it could be your family. Yeah, I mean, it's it's absolutely true because the cost of not you know, of early intervention and you go too far, it's it's tremendous. I mean, we've just seen where, to your point, it plays out everywhere. I think one of the other issues that we spend a lot of time focusing on is quality care and for these providers to get reimbursed at higher rates who are delivering quality care, really looking at outcomes and, you know, are people getting better and tearing that out. It's hard and it's a bigger, you know, move, but we don't, measure care in mental health. So it's just, and it's hard to measure care because what is, you know, what does success look like? And sometimes we say it's wake well, if someone comes in and they leave after four sessions, that means that they're, you know, having symptom reduction and they're doing better, but that doesn't necessarily mean it. It could mean that there just wasn't an alliance with the therapist. And so they bailed on it. Um, So that's one of the things that we're really working on is with, with a lot of partners, but how do we measure quality and then how do we pay for quality? 
You know, that's so, that's so important because one of the reasons, one of the objections I hear, even though it's whispered quietly, is, oh, somebody's just going to say they had a bad day and they've got to go get treated and then we got to pay for them. You know, um, I, I think we have to come up with some standard. Uh, and, you know, I spoke to that when we talk about AHIP, that's the American Health Insurance Providers, and and really told them they need to engage in this area of, of mental health, behavioral health. They they indicated to me they consider it to be really important to them. I hope that it's true. I'll, I will at some point follow up on that. But we do have to have a sense of what are we treating and and because when you're de- dealing with insurance and business and everything else, there's got to be some standards. And anything that you can do, working collaboratively with all these different groups, I think can can really move us forward. Yeah, it's also really helpful when we have people like you thinking about it, you know, getting involved with some organizations that are doing, you know, le- leading the way on some of this stuff. Because that's what it's going to take, right? It used to be, and Patrick, if he were here, he would say, you know, that we we separated out behavioral health from physical health, and that was kind of mistake number one. And now we're trying to figure out to bring what we all call like holistic health, bringing it back. But what? And I sometimes I just feel like when people say, "Oh, I, literally, I, I just moved Governor Case a couple weeks ago," and the mover, one of the movers, you know, you spend hours with these people. They're in your house or pack, and he said to me, "So what do you do?" And I said, "Oh, I run a mental health." education and navigation company. He goes, I have mental health. (laughs) (laughs) And I was just like looking at this like sweet, you know, get, you know, kid basically is a mover. And I'm like, you know, we all have mental health, you know, and we got got into this dialogue and he's like, no, 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 but I've got like some real issues. And I just, you know, I thought to myself, like we, people need to understand we all have mental health. We all have physical health. I mean, we all yeah. have bad days and good and days. And he probably had a particular jolt when he came in and saw how much that couch of yours weighed. <laughs> probably, yeah. Not making fun of him, but, you know, um, but you're, yeah, I think, look, this is something that touches about everyone. You know, there's some interesting statistics here with um, with this bloom. I can give you a couple of them. Um Eighty-eight percent of of working parents reported being interested in having access to a children's mental health program. I mean, that's that's a, that's just a huge number. Working parents are concerned. Listen to this: eighty-six percent believe children struggle with their mental health. Eighty-six uh, percent think that children need ways to help support their mental health. In other words, people are getting this now. Uh, it's still a difficult issue. I think people still. You know, the idea that you have a therapist or something, that is not a big deal anymore. Right, in my opinion, right. I, for, I don't, and I think it's, I think it's the, uh, the young people, the, uh, not the boomers, but the Gen Xers and the Gen Z. And I mean, it's not unusual for them to have somebody they can talk to. Right. And it's so good that they can talk to somebody. And because you're talking to somebody, there's not a stigma attached to it with the younger people. Maybe for older folks, there's still a stigma, but I think, and I just hadn't thought about that. It's the first time I've said it, but I think we've made a lot of progress. I do. But, you know, people can't afford these sessions, right? I mean, they have to pay out of pocket. A lot of the people in your your line of work, they won't take insurance. Um, And then the companies offer menu lists that, that don't have, sometimes don't have the full entree schedule, right? I mean, it's so limited. So right. I mean, there's so much that needs to be done. And I'm the, I am not an expert in this. These are just things that I've learned and things that I think about. But, you know, I think, Marjorie, my view is this. Um, some of this comes from my, my faith journey. But, you know, the story of the talents, that the master gave you talents, what did you do with them? Some mm-hmm. invested them wisely and got more. Some invested them sort of wisely, got a little less. And the person that put the talents in the ground had their talent taken away. For those of us who are blessed enough to have something, we have an obligation and a responsibility to do something in an area like this for others who don't have a voice. And there's not much they can do. Mm-hmm. Don't you think? I 100% do. I totally agree. It's, it's a, it's such a challenging issue. You know, I've, 
been in the space for decades and I used to push on the stigma, like, you know, we're talking about, right? And that's kind of, you know, how Patrick and I first met in the first place. And I was working with the Marines and doing, implementing really a mandatory counseling program to get everybody in because there was so much stigma. And now here we are in this post-COVID world and it's like the pendulum has swung the way other way. And now we have people just like owning their, their, you know, I have ADHD, I'm bipolar. I'm, and so I, I do, we talk a lot about how we kind of have to fall in the middle of all of this, where we can't let sort of now this, these diagnoses be the, what owns you, right? And it's to be able to say, I'm resilient and I'm going to work through it. But this is kind of, you know, where I think, you know, you're also going with the people that are helping is that we also just have to be able to get to a comfortable place with it, where it's like, these are my challenges and these I'm going to work on. Um, and that's kind of also that, that sense of like, what does an outcome look like, right? If you have bipolar, is it like, I can't hold down a job or I'm, I'm learning how to manage it um, with treatment? And then, and then I'm sorry, I've all, you, you just prompted all these thoughts for me. No, other, no, keep going. <laughs> the other thing is like when you talked about burnout, right? Part of the issue around burnout is, especially in mental health, is providers just see everything. So you think about it. I mean, everybody, you treat everything the same. It's how we're taught in school. So maybe at nine o'clock, you got ADHD. Then you've got, you know, somebody coming in with borderline personality disorder. Then you've got a substance use issue. And then you've got an eating disorder. And we're all like, that's exhausting. Better off, really, what we work on at Psych Hub is getting people moved into specialists so they can just work on one, you know, a type and do a better job with that and then be less burnt out. So I think that's as part of the issue in the whole field of why people get so burnt out is it's just so hard and then you're not paid enough. So I'm just drilling down the points that you mentioned. I, 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 yeah, so we have to... We have to peel it back. You know, how do you eat an elephant like one bite at a time? And um, so I think we're doing much better on the stigma. We now have the help, the, the helpline out there for people who are who are really at risk, although they're not answering that as much as they should. Apparently, a lot of those calls go unanswered. But I think what Andy has done in in Texas and what uh, Nationwide Children's has done with On Our Sleeves in Bloom so we're giving people information so they're not afraid. They, they can get a little sense of, of, of certainty and have a compass. The stigma is kind of gone uh, to a large degree, not totally, but I'm saying we've made progress on that. What Andy's done in terms of the collaborative care, what you're doing in trying to define what does success look like, those are all steps that need to be taken. And then ultimately, and this is a responsibility of, I think, the health insurance companies, how can they collaboratively work with the whole system to make sure that people are adequately covered and that we actually have mental health parity? And based on these things that you would define as, as um, you would define as, a, as success, as some sort of a measurement. Uh, and then we got to find some money and we're going to make a lot of progress with it. We do all those things. We should be we should be in much better shape. And also to make sure that we extend the ability of people to treat to people like social workers, you know, who can, in fact, be really helpful to people. Yeah. Has I mean, been, that's a good list, don't you think? That's like an amazing, I mean, that was like, you just summed the whole thing up right there. Um, and the ROI for finding that money is there. I mean, there's been so much evidence to show when you invest in early intervention and prevention, you know, yes. that- that you, that you, you know, you already brought it up. I mean, it just saves so, so much. We just, the system doesn't think that way. You know, we're a pretty reactive system, but yet, you know what I, I, someone once recently told me is that a doctor, a physician can send out information to their patients on weight loss, on smoking cessation, on diabetes, these different things. And they can actually put in a code and get reimbursed. There's no such code for mental health education. So some of it's just like you, you're almost baffled at how, how we don't think about, we think about terms healthcare and disease states, but we don't really think about, like, I think we're starting to. I wish I understood the financing better. Andy says that there are a number of areas where in fact you can get reimbursements, 
but it, and I don't know enough about it to be honest, but that's probably a, a world I need to really explore. I do know that the companies, when they offer a menu list, if the menu list is short um, for empl- for their employees, that you know even if they want to do more, they can't because the companies don't have the ability to expand the list and you know the whole menu list until later, and they, they need to push for that. But in terms of uh, and Andy should be a good guest. You should have him on to talk about the finances. But um, but we need we need the money. We need to figure out the financial side so that people don't have to choose between, you know, buying their kids a good meal and being able to get get some help for their kids. One of the things that's really frustrating for me as I, I sit in seeing all this is that there is a sense out there that if you go out of pocket and you see a provider that doesn't take insurance, that you're going to get better care or that to some degree, you know, the providers that take insurance aren't as good. And there it's it's not not at all true. There's not an ounce of truth in that. Um, in fact, those that take insurance are oftentimes better, more quality because the payers require some, you know, elements of quality to to the sessions. We have one in four people in the U.S. in Medicaid, right? So it's like you have, whether it's Medicaid, Medicare commercial, yep, the vast majority of Americans are covered under something and they deserve to be able to have those rights and those benefits and have quality providers. That's some of the stuff that frustrates me is that, you know, when you're so desperate as a parent or as a child or whoever you're getting help for or for yourself, you'll do anything and you'll pay anything. And then people accumulate all kinds of debt. And I think that's, that's one of the things that's so hard to watch. I completely agree. And that's why I think, you know, if we can go through the collaborative model and we can have the primary care physician being able to refer you to somebody, whether they're private or whether they're public, right, that that's, you're going to have some place you can go and they can send you to somebody. Uh, but we need to have that done. We need to expand that all across the country. And in order to hook up that, create the system to have that collaboration, it's going to take some dough for the doctor's offices. Think about when they needed to go to electronic records. You know, there was there were actually dollars provided to help them do it. There should be dollars provided to help them do this. And look, this issue, frankly, is is a bipartisan issue. This is an issue where, I mean, it doesn't matter what your political party is as to how, how you would be affected by this. So... Patrick and I and others like us uh, need to do a better job of of advocating. Uh, I'm not a lobbyist, so I can't go and lobby, but I can advocate as best I can. But I think, um, you know, we have like mental health month and all that. There ought to be there ought to be a big deal made of, during that period to get people's attention. You know, a major march on mental health um, visits to Capitol Hill, visits to the legislature all across the country and talk to them about these kinds of issues and find some real heroes, find some people who wake up every day and say, yeah, I'm going to get something done on this. Yeah. It's so fascinating to see people, especially politicians that have lived experience and they're having, whether it's their kids or, you know, that they've had some of their own experiences, um, whether it's overdose or substance use or something and addiction. And so it's real to them and they become really big champions. A niece, a neighbor, a cousin, a son, a daughter, a, 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 a partner, whatever. I mean, nobody escapes this. Everybody's in the loop. One of the things that we're really focused on at PsychHub, and we're re- we really believe that the whole ecosystem needs to be trained everybody on how to support each other, because there's just not everybody's going to get to a mental health provider, and not everybody needs one. And yet, really, sure. you never know when you are the person, whether it's clergy, whether it's a bartender, whether it's a hair person, whether it's whoever, somebody random. And we just um, had someone who one of our, our partners at Psych Hub, and he attempted suicide, um, he jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge, and thankfully he survived. But he was like, I was on a bus sobbing. I just wanted someone to pay attention to me. And so I think part of this is, whether it's teachers or first responders, we're not trained. We're afraid of it. We don't know what to say. We think we have to fix things. And you don't really, sometimes you just need to listen. You just need to know how to listen and then, you know, be able to kind of get people to that care or whatever. So 
I think that's part of where when we think about funding is just putting education, knowledge into the, and in just, you know, injecting it into the whole system. That's why it's so good that, you know, we, with, with Nationwide Children's, and we need to, I keep talking about them, but I believe so strongly in them, uh, organizations like that, that can take the clinical research, um, mm-hmm. and not some pop science, but the real stuff, and get mm-hmm. it to people so they can, they can know uh, what to do. And uh, I'll tell you, the other one that's interesting is the Surgeon General, Dr. Murthy, you know, he's one of the things that he targets is loneliness. Right. And, uh, you know, we are we are connected. And sometimes it's just a kind word, a smile, looking somebody in the eye. How are you? How's your family? We're moving so fast in this society because uh, it seems in many respects, the devices that we're connected to force us to move. But sometimes we got to disconnect and slow down. A hundred percent. So I want to, I know you were on your own podcast. I was wondering if you could share with us a little bit about it. What's the theme called of it? Kasich and Klepper. Jordan is a, uh, is a comedian. And um, I think people didn't expect a, a former governor and political <laughs> type. Uh, I'm now a businessman, but to be connected to a comedian and people didn't know what to expect. Sometimes we'll do, we, you know, we do topical issues. Sometimes we do talk about politics, but a lot of times we meet with people who just want to talk about the things that they're fascinated by, interested in. Um, we've had everyone, well, we've had actors, actresses, uh, sports celebrities, uh, newscasters, all kinds of folks. And we talk about life and it's it's designed for us all to find a common ground and make it comfortable for people. And that doesn't mean that politics doesn't figure in because it does. But the focus of it is trying to find a middle ground with people who come from very different places who can have a conversation and reach some sort of a, a, of an agreement. That's what it's about. So it's Kasich and Klepper. It's on all the platforms and I hope people will check it out. I think you'll enjoy I, it. I love that. And then I guess my one of my last questions is tell us a little bit about what you're doing now as a as a politician converted businessman. Um, what are some of the things well, you've been in and out? Uh, I, 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 Marjorie, I've been in and out of politics. You know, I was uh, young, very young, the youngest elected state senator in Ohio history, went to Congress. I was 30, which is amazing, served nine terms and then left. And I did some work uh, on Wall Street. I worked in television. I had a speaking career. I've written five books. Four of them are bestsellers. In fact, I'm going to begin to work on a a new one coming up. And, um, you know, I served on boards. And it's very much the same thing. After giving all that up and becoming governor and then leaving, I started my own business where we work uh, to help uh, both companies that, that have a connection between business and government and people. We try to become advisors to them to help them sometimes market new ideas, market new products, sometimes to help them to figure out policy issues, how they should proceed. I mean, a variety of things we do with them. Though That business is in the environmental space. It's in the mental health space. Uh, it's in the pure business side of things. I mean, it's, it's, it's a wide variety, and I've got some really exciting things coming. And then I also work at CNN. Um, this is my fourth year being there. I've got my podcast, I make speeches, and uh, and I serve on an advisory board. And then I have twin girls who have just graduated from college. Ooh. And uh, they say those years between 22 and 26 for parents get to be stressful because all of a sudden kids are growing up, they're adults, they're trying to find their own way, and we have to help them. And I have a, have a great wife, so um, which then gives me a great life. So everything <laughs> is pretty good. I still uh, am interested and and involved, but in terms of uh, electoral future, I just don't know. I haven't really spent a lot of time thinking about that, but I am going to this Ideas Festival in Austin, which will get some people saying, what's he doing there? And we'll see. And I also (laughs) like love traveling and speaking publicly because you saw me at one of those conferences. And what I try to do there is to give people a sense that that they're the most powerful. They're, don't r- wait on some other politician or somebody else. You have the ability to change that part of the world in which you live. And, and I think people get a little cynical about it, but I happen to think it's true. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you're you're still serving, you know, you served in politics and now you're still serving in these different capacities. And um, I think that's what's 
really most admirable of you is that you haven't really stopped. And, you know, both, I think we need to let our listeners. I don't think the Lord, Marjorie, has given us a retirement plan. (laughs) I think our retirement plan comes when it's time to leave the earth. But up until then, there's there's a lot of a lot of work and responsibility I think we all have. And that's that's a that's a really good way to look at it. You know, I want our listeners to know that the organizations that you've been talking about that you're part of, both the Meadows Institute and On Your Sleeves um, and Bloom, these are nonprofits. And so um, I think that's just also important yeah. to note that you are, yeah. you know, you, you, we can feel your passion and you're, you're not just like sitting on an advisory board, you're involved, you're engaged. And um, yeah. those are really critical, really, really critical pieces to that giving, continuing to serve. Well, when you invite me in to do something, be ready because <laughs> I'm not a potted plant. <laughs> I, I All right, love Melissa, it. I've got to get running. Good to be Thank with you. you. And so best to, to Patrick, really you know, who turned real difficulty into a, a blessing and his wife and your work. And uh, I, I have no doubt we'll have a lot of time to spend together in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. As always, thank you for listening to our podcast. If you enjoyed the show, drop us a review. If you haven't already, subscribe to our podcast for the latest episodes. For the latest insights, check us out at psychhub.com. 